I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not going to dump on Vegas. I don't know if people are going to expect that. I'm not. Uh, Vegas, very simply put, have been a victim of their own success. Now, I, I know there's a lot of people who looked at last season and said, oh, everything was all rigged in favor of them. So let's look back to the annual from last year and see. Uh, Vegas Golden Knights, this is the preseason prediction before this season. Not this year, but the first year. After rolling the dice in the expansion and entry drafts, the Vegas Golden Knights are like Penn without Teller, Mike, and no magic. Carrot Top minus the props, not bad, but they're definitely missing something. GM George McPhee has put the initial building blocks in place for the NHL's 31st franchise, but now full-scale constru construction becomes the ongoing task. The inaugural roster should be good enough to keep the Golden Knights from winding up buried in the desert like a couple of gone-wrong goodfellas. Whether they go from lounge act to rat pack is the question. Offense. The toughest part of an expansion draft is finding any semblance, any semblance of offense, yet the Golden Knights were able to secure some scoring talent as they poached NHL teams' rosters. Jonathan Marcheseau and one-time 40-goal man James Neal will be the main drivers of whatever offense the Knights can muster. The only hope is former 20-goal wingers David Perron and Riley Smith can rediscover their scoring touch. The Golden Knights' biggest deficiencies down the middle as the 1-2 tandem of 30-year-old KHL import Vadim Shipachev and Dallas cast off Cody Eakin is far from proven. Vegas has a few young wild cards up front who could pitch in offensively, namely six foot four winger Alex Tuck, energetic left winger Brandon Leipzig, and former Rangers depth center Oscar Lindbergh, but finding goals will be a problem. Uh, defense, the Knights managed to pluck a handful of respectable young blue, not blue liners in Shea Theodore, Nate Schmidt, Colin Miller, and Braden McNabb. Theodore, a 22-year-old who ranked 22nd in THN's Future Watch in 2017 as the prize of the bunch, and has the potential to grow into a top-pairing defenseman, the emerging Schmidt, performed well for Washington in the playoffs this past spring and is familiar to former Capitals GM McPhee. Miller skates and shoots exceptionally well and was quietly effective over two seasons in Boston. Uh, Vegas resident Derek England, scooped up from Calgary, leads the veteran portion of the defense corps, along with Jason Garrison, Jason Garrison Lucas Spiza, and Clayton Stoner. Goaltending the Knights landed their number one goalie in an instant fan favorite by nabbing Mark andre Fleury from Pittsburgh. He's a three-time Stanley Cup champion and is motivated after losing his starting job to Matt Murray. If Fleury eventually becomes a trade bait, Vegas has a potential number one in Calvin Pickard. He played 50 games for Colorado last year and was a standout for Canada's silver, winning, silver medal winning entry at the 2017 World Championships. And there you go. That was the prediction right there. And they were predicted to be worse than the league, last in the Pacific. Thanks for coming out. That was the prediction. So what did Vegas do? They get 51 wins, 24 losses, and 7 overtime or shootout losses. They score 272 goals. They have 228 goals against. In goals for, they're fourth in the league. They're eighth in goals against. Their power play, 21.37%. Their penalty kill, 81.43%. All of these numbers, well, well, well above any projections made by the most optimistic fan of the expansion team going into their season. At home, they were 29-10-2, and, and on the road, they were 22-14-5. Versus the East, they were 18, 11, and 3. Versus the West, they were 33, 13, and 4. They owned their division that year. Uh, that year being, of course, last season. October, they're 8 and 3. November, they're 7, 5, and 1. December, 11, 1, and 1. January, 7, 3, and 2. The month we're in now, they were 8, 5, and 1 for the month. They did not have a down month. They didn't have a single month where you look and you go, oh, it looks like the cracks are starting to show. Maybe November, but that's when they got down to their fifth goaltender. Every injury in the world takes place with their goaltending, but the team itself remains relatively healthy. Carlson leads the way in scoring with 43 goals and 35 assists, blowing away any expectations before that season and raising the bar probably too high. Jonathan Marcheseau, 27 goals, 48 assists. Notice as well that with 75 points, Marcheseau is a plus 36. Carlson's a plus 49. Yeah, these numbers aren't sustainable over... Two seasons. One, yeah. Second season is going to be tougher. Perron, who ended up leaving, 16 goals, 50 assists, 66 points, a plus one. Uh, Riley Smith, 22 goals, 38 assists, 60 points, a plus 31. Eric Howla, who's been hurt, 29 goals, 26 assists, but he's a minus 16. 
So defensively, kind of a misadventure. Uh, James Neal, 25 goals, 19 assists. He was a minus 11, and a lot of those 25 goals he scored the first half of the year. Marc-Andre Fleury played 46 games, 29 wins, 13 losses, 4 overtime or shootout losses, 927 save percentage. Subban, 24 games, played 13-4-2 record with a 9-10 save percentage. So all of these numbers are better than the numbers on this side of the board. And that's this season. And I, I, I had a bad feeling that the 109-point first season going to Stanley Cup Final would be their worst enemy. The season that this team is having is very respectable for a team that's in its second year in the league. They're in a playoff spot. They're in a playoff spot. They don't look like a contender, but they're in a playoff spot. And a team in its second year of existence, that's remarkable. That's why, like I said, I'm not just going to dump on the team here. Uh, they're 31, 24, and 4 right now, which is 175 goals for, 170, 168 goals against. They're on pace for 91.7, or about 92 points. So they're on pace to be about 17 points off where they were last year. And I thought they would drop by probably about 15. Um, at home, they're 16, 9, and 3. So they've already dropped as many games at home this year as they did all of last season. So 9 and 3 equals 12, 10 and 2 equals 12, as an example. On the road, they're 15, 15, and 1. So they've already lost as, they've already lost one more in regulation than they lost on the road all year last year. Uh, versus these, they're 14, 13, and 2. They've already lost more in regulation than they lost all last year against them. Uh, versus the West, they're 17, 11, and 2, which is a far cry from 33, 13, and 4. October, they're 5, 6, and 1. Their first losing record in a month in the team's existence. Uh, November, they're 9 and 6. December, 9, 3, and 3. January, 6 and 4. And this month, they've been 2 and 5. And of course, they've lost 5 in a row at home. So what's been going on? Now, when you look at the totals from last year to this year, and I included James Neal because I was going to include a couple of guys who are additions to the roster. So Marsh is so right now, 19 goals, 21 assists, 40 points. He's on pace for like a like his career average kind of numbers. Alex Tuck, 16 goals, 24 assists. Of course, he's been injured. His plus minus is at plus 7. Marsh is at minus 5 as opposed to the plus 36 of last season. Carlson, 18 goals, 19 assists. He's a minus 6 compared to the plus 49 of last year. Smiths, 9 goals, 22 assists. Again, he's had injury issues as well. Plus 2, plus 31 last year. Pacioretty, 16 goals, 14 assists. He's a minus 11. Bit of a defensive liability when he's not scoring. Uh, the goals have been coming, but you know Pacioretty basically replaces what James Neal brought last year. Stastny, 7 goals, 16 assists in only 29 games. He's a plus 5. Stastny's been fantastic, and I do think he nicely replaces what Perron brought to the, brought to the lineup. When, when you look at it right away, the first thing you notice is they don't have a guy who's going to score 40. Not only that, they probably don't have anybody who's going to score 30 this year. Carlson may very well end up with 25, 26 goals, and that's fine. That's still well above what he would have been projected to get as a member of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, if Marcia So and Smith both end up with totals between, well, for Marcia So to be about 50, 55 points, uh, Smith ends up with about 40, 45 points. I've, I've watched Riley Smith enough in his career because I watched him in Boston, Dallas, Florida. This is kind of what Riley Smith is. He can be very frustrating at times, which is why Florida wanted to get rid of him, and they were willing to throw in Marcia So to make, him, make his contract go away. Uh, they didn't want to pay him that money for as long as he had left on the contract. And it's still not a great contract. You look at the goaltending numbers. Fleury, uh, 51 games played. He's already played five more games than he played all of last year. I thought the injury last year kind of helped keep him fresh. Uh, he's 29-18-4, and four, so the win numbers are the same. The losses, there's more. And his safe percentage only at 908 as opposed to the 927 of last year. Subban, uh, who has played... Uh, he has not played 25 games. Um, he's 2-5 and five right now. I think he's played 9 games. Anyways, he's 2-5. and five. He's got a 904 safe percentage. So for Subban, uh, it has not been a banner year. But again, when Malcolm Subban was picked up on waivers, it was because Calvin Pickard, nowhere near what clearly uh, George McPhee saw before the expansion draft. So he picks up Subban on waivers from Boston. Why is Subban available from Boston? 
because he couldn't outperform Kudobin for the backup job. And Boston was kind of tired of lugging him around. And now here we are a year and a half later, and Subban could very well find himself out of out of Vegas. The the players you pick up when you're when you're dealing with an expansion draft, there's there's two things. Either they're overpaid, the team considers them overpaid, or you're picking up guys who there's something in their game that just the team left them exposed because they wanted to get rid of them. Now, the benefit for Vegas was that because the expansion draft was um, exposing a lot of really good talent, they got to get a guy like Tuck, they got a guy like Theodore, and that helped them greatly. But there is not, when I look at Vegas, and I've, I've watched it up close, I watched the two overtime losses around Christmas time, and for me, they work hard, I think they're well coached. Um, I think their blue line's undermanned. I think they need a top four. I don't think they have a real true, like they don't have a Drew Doughty, and you're not going to have that your first couple of years because people don't expose that defenseman. They don't trade that defenseman unless you have one to trade back, like the Subban for Weber deal. And and it's it's you kind of have to draft and develop that guy. So whether it's going to be Brandstrom eventually or not, I don't know. But with with Vegas, and when you look at all these numbers, and then you look at in goals for right now, they're 12th. Goals against, they're 13th. They've kind of gone back to just, they're an average team. A little bit above average, but they're in that average realm. Uh, their power play, 17.71% a drop from last year. Their penalty kill is actually better than last year at 82.56% compared to 81.43 last year. Parts of Vegas's game have gotten better, but I think... The emotional lift this team had as, hey, this is our first time through. This is our first season. I kind of think that's gone. I think that newness is gone. And I also think teams are more prepared for whatever Vegas is going to do. I think that the things they were doing last year that they were able to use to to, to uh, promote their game and make their record better, I don't think they're able to do those things this year. And I, I, I think where we can see things starting to change for for Vegas was the finals. As soon as as soon as Washington's doing the cross crease pass and and Vegas had no answer, I went, "Oh crap." Uh Barry Trotz has done his homework and he's found a weakness in Vegas. Uh and and you know, they they didn't really have an answer and before you know it, the Capitals are the champs. Now, my only concern with Vegas really going forward is this. Stasny's at six point five million until twenty twenty one. Carlson is an RFA this summer. How much are they going to pay him? I don't know, but they've already spent seventy two point eight seven five million dollars for next season. The cap goes up to eighty three million dollars. That means they have a little over ten million dollars in cap space next season, and Carlson's an RFA. Smith five million dollars till twenty twenty two. Marchessault's five million dollars till twenty twenty four. Pacioretty, $7 million till 2023. That extension, of course, kicks in this summer. And looking at where Pacioretty's numbers are now, you might have been able to get them for cheaper. This is why when I saw these guys being extended so far ahead of time, I thought, wait, why? And not only that, but you look at Eakin, he's $3.8 million for another year. Reeves is $2.75 million to 2020. Alex Tuck at $4.75 million. Yes, it could very well end up being a bargain. The guy's one of the top scorers. But what is Tuck's ceiling? Tuck's a powerful guy, but when he goes cold, he can go cold for a while. He has two assists now in the last 11 games. He is signed till 2026. That's seven years from now. And at the time it was signed, my problem wasn't the cap hit. It was term. Because, again... At some point, Vegas is going to want to do some upgrading, and they don't really have the money to do it. You look on the blue line, the top four blue liners, Shea Theodore at $5.2 million until 2025, Miller, $3.87 million until 2022, McNabb, $2.5 million until 2022, and Schmidt, $5.95 million until 2025. You can look at these guys separately, and you can make the argument that, yes, this guy's worth this, this guy's worth that. You add it all up, and it adds up to about $17 million for that top four. And then you ask yourself, $17 million for that top four, how does it compare to other top fours in the league? And that's that's my concern. Flurries at $7 million until 2022. That extension kicks in this summer as well. And Subban, he's a restricted free agent this summer. 
So are they going to go in another direction in goal? Are they going to renew Subban? Does Subban get traded out? Do they bring somebody else in? Remember, $10 million, maybe eleven to play with next summer, unless they can get rid of some contracts. And, and this is why uh, I have some concerns with them. Like, Reeves is $2.75 million this year and next year. Not really a problem. But I think if 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 you asked other GMs what what would Reeves be worth, I don't know that two point seven five million is is the number. Uh, my my one issue with George McPhee hasn't been um, that he signed guys to extensions. It's just been it's felt like he's maybe a quarter of a million, half a million higher than what he might have paid otherwise, and that really adds up. Um, and and I I do wonder like where things are going to end up. Like, I, I really think with Riley Smith, this is who he is. Uh, Riley Smith, before he went to Vegas, this is kind of the the numbers you'd see from him. You'd see one really, really good year, and then the next year he'd fall off. And the effort's still there. He's still playing. He's still the same guy, but for whatever reason, every other year he seems to go cold. Um, and 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 now Pacioretty's there for a while. And I ask myself, like, okay, so next year you got Cody Glass coming in. Next year, you probably got Branstrom coming into the lineup as well. But what does the future look like for this team? How veteran-laden is this team without a whole lot of cap space? And and that's my issue with Vegas. I think what we're seeing right now, this is about it. They are, they are not a team blessed with a lot of high-end talent. They have to work harder than the other team. They have to be smarter than the other team. And I think that in the case of Gerard Gallant, he has to completely change strategies he has to work on the power play. He has to work on their defensive positioning. And at some point, George McPhee is going to have to take this, this core and do something with it. The additions of Stastny and Pacioretty still don't bother me. I think they're fine. I think Pacioretty, 25-30 goal scorer, you need those. That makes sense. Stastny, pretty solid forward. My only issue is, which guy is your primary scorer? Your, your 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 big star player and is that going to be Cody Glass or did they potentially trade that with Nick Suzuki going to Montreal I was fine with that trade at the time but even at the time I said you know Suzuki it seems like kind of a high price to pay and the way that that McPhee has just handed off draft picks I was I was praising him around expansion time for all the draft picks he added and then it was like when the team was good he went okay so we're good and he moved out all those draft picks I, I do have some concern about the amount of draft picks that, that Vegas has has gotten rid of. They had all of these extra extra draft picks. And it's just basically their lottery tickets. It's, okay, well, there's no guarantee that that second rounder would have made it. Right. But if you have three second rounders, your odds of, of having a guy who makes it are better than if you have one or two. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, almost any team that you look and you go, oh, wow, look, they got a steal in the third round. Yeah, but they may have missed in the first. They may have missed in the second. It is it is really, truly, I mean, we have the draft lottery to decide one, two, and three, but the draft is kind of a lottery the whole way through. So there you go. Comparing Vegas from last year to Vegas of this year. And again, as I said, I'm not trying to dump on the team. I just, I, I kind of feel like this is a more realistic view of of the team and of where they're at. I think they're still probably a, a, a playoff team at the end of this season. I, I can't see them dropping out. They are currently at 66 points. Uh, the Canucks are at, are at 59. So, I mean, the Canucks are there, but Vegas has games in hand. on. I think they have one game in hand, two games in hand, I think, on Vancouver. And I, I just I can't see Vancouver going on a run and getting third in the division. And I can't see Vegas continuing the losing like this. This just this is how it, how it works, that you'll have these up and down times. Uh, Vegas will have up times as well. I'm just wondering what this team's going to look like by the end of this season, and what do you do if you're George McPhee? I know, Braden McNabb right now is the guy you can just throw under the bus. Very easy to go, McNabb, throw him under the bus. But it's not that simple. I think there's a lot more going on here, and uh, McPhee's got a lot of guys tied up to a very long contract, considering it's a team only in its second year. And that was my concern all the way along. I thought, you know what? Give them give them contracts, but don't give them that much term because it's a brand new team. You don't know where you're going to be in a couple years. Um, and, and it, you know, you sometimes you catch lightning in a bottle. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. As always, don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll talk to you again soon.